Hello everyone, welcome back. In this video, we're gonna talk about alternating series. We'll start by defining what an alternating series is, and then we'll discuss some important uh, results and concepts involving these special types of series. So it doesn't matter if that first term of an alternating series is positive or negative, all that really matters is as we go between the terms, the signs between the terms are switching. So most of the examples we're gonna work with are gonna be pure alternating series where as we go between the terms, we are always switching between positive and negative values. However, a lot of the results do not depend on this pure alternation. As long as we are eventually becoming an alternating series, a lot of these results will still apply. And so let's go ahead and look at an example of a couple alternating series. And so here's an example of an alternating series. Our first term is one, our second term is negative one half, the third term is positive one third, the fourth term is negative one fourth, and so on. And this series should look very familiar. It resembles that harmonic series we discussed earlier. The difference now is we have the same terms in our harmonic series, but now the terms are alternating signs. So the first one is positive, then negative, positive, negative, and so on. And here is one way to express our alternating harmonic series using our sigma or summation notation. We can write it as the sum from n equals one to infinity of the quantity negative one raised to the power of n plus one divided by n. And so that first term corresponds to n equals one. The second term corresponds to n equals two, n equals three, n equals four, and so on. When we are looking at our alternating series in the sigma notation or in the summation form, we'll often see something like negative one raised to the power of n or n plus one or n minus one or something like that. And that is a good indicator that you are most likely working with an alternating series. This is essentially the piece or factor of our series that is causing the alternation. It may not always look like negative one raised to some power of n. You may see it using a trig function instead, but the most common way is negative one raised to some power like n or n plus one. And whether it'll be negative one to the power of n or n plus one or n minus one will really just kind of depend on, do you want that first term in your series to be positive or negative? Then you just have to adjust that exponent of negative one to make it work. So here we notice for that first term, n is equal to one, we get negative one to the power of one plus one or two, and negative one to the power of two or squared is gonna turn into a positive one. We could have also written this as negative one to the power of n minus one. That wouldn't have made a difference at all in how we represent the series. We get the exact same result. And so this alternating harmonic series is the first example of an alternating series that we're looking at together, but it's also one of the most important examples of a series. We'll talk more about why that is later on, but one important fact I wanna note about this alternating harmonic series is that it converges, right? When we talked about the normal uh, harmonic series without the alternation, that was an example of a series that diverged. However, the alternating harmonic series is going to be convergent. All right, here I have a second example of an alternating series. This time, our series in its expanded or long form is looking like negative one half plus two thirds minus three fourths plus four fifths minus five sixths and so on. And so the first thing I'll try to do here is try to capture the alternation that is occurring within this series. So we can use a factor of negative one to help us do that, but now we have to raise it to a power so that the first term, or when we plug in n equals one, we'll get negative one, and then for the second term, we'll get a positive one, third term we'll get negative one again, and so on. Well, if we just use negative one to the power of n, that should do the job because the first power of negative one will make that first term negative. When we go to the second term, when n is equal to two, that'll turn everything positive. And then from there on, we'll just keep switching back and forth from negative to positive, negative to positive, and so on. So that first piece, the negative one to the power of n is really capturing the alternation that is happening between the terms in our series. So now let's go ahead and try to describe the rest of the terms in our series. And for that, we have to notice a pattern between the terms or between like the numerator and the denominator of each term. Well, if we look at the, uh, the numerators of all these terms, they're just going up by one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on. And let's see, the first one is one, the second one is two, then the third one is three and so on. So that number in the numerator really does correspond exactly to our index value of n. Similarly, 
The number in our denominator is also increasing one at a time, but it is offset by the number in the numerator. It is always one more than the number in our numerator. So if the number in our numerator was n, the number in our denominator has to be one more, and that'll be n plus one. That alternating harmonic series is going to be a convergent series, and we don't have the tools quite yet. That's what we're gonna discuss next, but soon we'll be able to show that the second example of an alternating series is going to be a divergent series. So we're gonna run into and work with these alternating series quite often when we talk about a later topic in this class called power series. And we're gonna to need to know if those power series or these alternating series are converging or not. And it's actually much easier to determine the uh, convergence or divergence of an alternating series compared to a non-alternating series. And the way we do that is using something like the alternating series test. And so what the alternating series test says is if we have an alternating series of the form, the sum from n equals one to infinity of negative one to the n times b sub n, or the sum from n equals one to infinity of negative one to the n plus one times b sub n. Basically, this is uh, when we start with a negative term and this is when we start with a positive term. And in this kind of special way of writing these alternating series, those coefficients besides the alternation part b sub n's, uh, b sub n is denoting the coefficient and it's always a positive number. The negative or the sign of the number will be given by that negative one to the n or n plus one involved. And so the alternating series test says an alternating series will converge if these two conditions are met. The first condition is the n plus first term is smaller than the nth term. So that's a way of saying as we go further in the terms in our series, they are getting smaller and smaller. And the second condition kind of related to that first one is the terms in our series are eventually approaching zero. When we first started talking about the convergence and divergence of a series, we had that test called the divergence test. And that said, if our series or the terms in our series, I should say, approach anything other than zero, then it's impossible for us to converge. It did not say, however, that if the terms in our series approach zero, that's enough to guarantee convergence. So for a normal non-alternating series, having the terms go to zero does not mean you're gonna converge. Just think of the harmonic series as your example of a series that the terms go to zero, but it does not converge. An alternating series with terms going to zero and also decreasing uh, will definitely converge. And our alternating harmonic series is the example of that alternating series that converges with the terms decreasing and going to zero. So in our video, we're not gonna prove the alternating series test, but we will spend a minute to talk about why it is true and kind of the idea behind the, the technical proof. So as I mentioned before, um, a lot of these results are gonna hold even if our series isn't initially alternating or if our terms aren't initially decreasing, um, as long as eventually that kind of behavior happens and then happens past that point. But for the sake of kind of outlining the proof here, let's assume that we have the perfect situation where right from the get-go, our terms are alternating and are always decreasing. Think of something like the alternating harmonic series as we go through this proof. So to start our proof, I'm gonna start by actually just graphing a number line. And so this will be the start of our number line at zero. And as we move off to the right, we'll be looking at larger and larger positive numbers, of course. And what we're gonna be actually be graphing on this number line itself are gonna be the partial sums of our alternating series, where we assume this alternating series has terms that are decreasing in size and are getting closer and closer to zero as we take the limit. And the argument we're about to use here is going to apply even if our first term is negative, but just for the sake of how we're drawing our number line and picture over here, let's assume we're working with an alternating series of the form, the sum from n equals one to infinity of negative one to the n plus one times b sub n. And so that means our first term is going to be positive. And so let's think about that first term as b1. Well, that's gonna be some positive number. And if we think about the first partial sum of our series, well, that'll just be the sum of the first term and that'll be just B1. So S1 is corresponding to the first partial sum of our series where we just do the sum from N equals one to one. Okay, so now we're ready to add in the second term to our series and construct the second partial sum. Well, let's see, what is the second term in our series gonna look like? Well, if our first term was positive and we're in an alternating series, the second term is going to be negative, and we're also assuming the terms in our series, ignoring the alternation, are decreasing in size, 
So that means B2 is going to be a negative number, and it's going to be a negative number that's smaller than B1. All right, so now we have our second term, B2, or negative B2, represented above our number line. Right, the length of that line segment representing B2 is going to be shorter than the one for B1, because we know the terms in our series are decreasing and getting smaller and smaller. And I'm placing it right here because the end of B1 is our first partial sum. And so now if we want to figure out where is our second partial sum going to be on this number line, we have to take a step back because of the cancellation that is occurring due to our second term, negative B2. And so if we add these two numbers together, the length of that remaining line segment will represent our second partial sum. So now let's go ahead and repeat this procedure for a few more terms in this alternating series. So if we want to go from our second partial sum to our third partial sum, we have to add on to our second partial sum the third term, B3. And what do we know about B3? Well, the previous term was negative, so B3 is going to be positive, making our partial sum bigger and moving it farther to the right. How far to the right is it going to go? Well, we know it can't go further to the right than S1, because that would indicate that B3 would have to be longer in this line segment representation than B2. We know that can't be possible because the terms in our series are always decreasing in size and getting smaller and smaller. So it has to be some line segment going in the opposite direction, but smaller than B2. Then if we add that third term to our second partial sum, it'll increase our partial sum to about here. So our third partial sum might be there. All right, so what do we know about our fourth term? Well, it's going to be negative and smaller than our third term. So maybe it's that much smaller than our third term. Let's go ahead and call that negative B4. And well, that, that fourth term, when we add it on to our third partial sum, is going to make our next partial sum smaller than our third partial sum, move it back to the left a little bit, giving us S4, our fourth partial sum. And this kind of behavior is going to repeat forever as we go further and further looking at more and more partial sums for this series. We can see we're going to take a big step forward, then a smaller step backwards, then a smaller step forward, smaller step back, smaller step forward, smaller step back, and so on. And we basically kind of wiggle back and forth and slowly approach the, uh, the sum of our series. Because the terms in our alternating series are decreasing and getting closer and closer to zero, we know we're going to keep bouncing uh, above and below this sum, and eventually we have to reach it because, well, the size of the steps we're taking are getting smaller and smaller and eventually going to zero. And so this little picture we've drawn is by no means a rigorous proof for the alternating series test, but it is the main idea behind the actual proof for the alternating series test. Because of these conditions, our alternating series is going to have to kind of oscillate back and forth above and below the sum of its series until it kind of eventually reaches there because the terms are decreasing, alternating, and getting closer and closer to zero. So I think spending a minute together to look at this uh, picture is really helpful for seeing where the alternating series test comes from and to see that it is a legitimate test. But I want us to take a little bit more of a closer look at this picture because it has another really important use. It's going to help us kind of figure out how to approximate a uh, alternating series using a partial sum and kind of working with the error in such an approximation. And so remember, the error in uh, approximating a series using a partial sum is really just what we call the remainder of the series. The partial sum is just the sum of the first n terms of the series. So the error is kind of the sum of all the missing pieces of our series, like the n plus first term, the n plus second term, the n plus third, and so on. It's just the sum of the remaining terms in our series that did not make it into the partial sum. So I want us to make an important observation here. Let's kind of maybe look at our picture here and figure out what does the error look like for our third partial sum. So we know the sum of our series is going to be somewhere between S3 and S4, as drawn on our number line in our picture here. And the error is just going to be the, the difference or the distance between our partial sum and the actual sum of our series. And so here we can visualize the error in using our third partial sum. It's just the difference between the actual sum of our series and that third partial sum. 
and we can denote that as r sub 3, which is our notation for the remainder with n equals 3 of the sum of our series. And so what we see in this picture here is that the error in using our third partial sum, the error here is going to be less than the size of our fourth term. And that's going to be true for any partial sum we look at. So if we look at the, uh, the first partial sum, the, uh, the error between that first partial sum and the sum of our series, that error is always smaller than the, s the next term in our series. It works for the first term, the, the third term, it works for the hundredth term, it works at any partial sum for our series. And another way to see that in our picture is, well, due to the nature of our series, notice how in each step or iteration, we're always going over the actual sum of our series. So B1 is our first partial sum, uh, B2 moves us over here to our second partial sum, but we had to cross over the true sum of our series to get here. B3 is going to move us back to the right, again, overstepping our partial sum. B4 is going to move us back to the left, making us closer to our partial sum, but still overstepping it. Then B5 would be positive, moving us further to the right over here, but still even closer to our partial sum. This really important observation is just that the next term in our series is always going to be bigger than the error in using the previous partial sum. And so this observation or argument is what gives us a way of estimating the error in using a partial sum to approximate the sum of an alternating series. Or we might describe this as like a remainder theorem for alternating series. All right, so here's a summary of what we just stated, and we can call this the remainders in alternating series or like the air in alternating series. So if an alternating series satisfies the conditions of the alternating series test, so it's an alternating series, the terms are always decreasing or at least past a certain point are always decreasing, and they are approaching zero, so we have this special convergent alternating series, then the remainder um, of the nth partial sum or the error in using the nth partial sum to approximate the series is always going to be less than the n plus first term or that next term that didn't make it into our partial sum. So r sub n is denoting the remainder of our nth partial sum, and that can be also thought of as the sum of our series s minus the nth partial sum of our series, right? Remember, the sum of our series s is the sum of all the terms from 1 to infinity, the nth partial sum is the uh, the sum of the terms from 1 to n. So this is really also just the sum from n plus 1 to infinity. 